uh, introduce the speaker today. Dr. Gar. Thank you. Thank you, Ramandeep, and thank you for organizing this seminar series. And I'm happy that today we have Dr. Amit Singh, who is an associate professor at IC Bangalore, who is going to give us this seminar on, on mycobacterium tuberculosis. So anybody coming from IC Bangalore, we know the guy has to be good. <laughs> and that's why, you know, <clears throat> I think the entire Teachers Day family is going to talk. And as you would know that we have a fairly strong tuberculosis group here and a large number of students who are interested in tuberculosis research. So I think today's seminar would be very good for them. So thank yeah. you very much for accepting our request and over to Nishit for a formal introduction. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. My pleasure, <clears throat> sir. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have with us um, uh, Dr. Amit Singh. So it's our pleasure to have him here. So uh, Dr. Amit uh, has done his master's in, uh, uh, from uh, in IIT Roorkee 1998 in biotechnology. And then he joined uh, Dr. Anand Tyagi's lab for his PhD in, uh, and completed PhD in 2004. After that, he went to <clears throat> University of Alabama to work with Edry Stein's lab, uh, where he worked on uh, some of the seminal works, including development of a mycobacterial protein, protein interaction uh, tool, and understanding the role of YB3. So the work has been uh, highly cited, and uh, that particularly that MPFC tool was used by a lot of TB researchers, including us. And after that, uh, he moved to ICGB in 2010 uh, as a welcome uh, trust fellow, intermediate fellow, where he uh, stayed for uh, four years till 2014. And from 2014 uh, onwards till date, he's in the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, first, he moved as an assistant professor. And then uh, in 2018, he was promoted as the associate professor. So uh, Dr. Amit is, uh, you know, is known for his work on uh, primarily on uh, uh, redox biology and homeostasis uh, related to mycobacterium tuberculosis and HIV. And uh, he has published a huge number of papers, uh, some of the, in some of the good journals like Science Translational Medicine, eLife, Floss Pathogen, JBC, PNS, et cetera. Uh, considering his uh, contribution to the science Last year, he was awarded with the prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, along with uh, many other awards which he has uh, you know, been fel felicitated with over the last uh, few years, which includes the uh, Innovative Young Bioscientist Award, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Nasi Scopus Award, the National Bioscience Science Award, and also he has been elected as a Fellow of National Academy of Science. So it is our great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Amit here for this uh, seminar series. And today is going to talk about the uh, iron sulfur cluster biogenesis regulation and uh, their role in metabolism and survival of mycobacterium tuberculosis pathogens. So over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Nishit. Thanks, Nishit. It's a real pleasure to um, speak uh, in front of all my friends uh, at THSTI. And thank you for a very kind and generous introduction. So today, I'll start uh, without further delay that today's talk is going to be on iron sulfur cluster biogenesis um, and how um, iron sulfur cluster biogenesis is regulated and also on the maturation of iron sulfur clusters. And this has been a field which I've been working during my postdoc days where we used to work on iron sulfur cluster containing transcriptional regulators. So that from there to now looking into iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. So, um, I have organized my talk um, into uh, three distinct parts. One, um, I'm going to give you an introduction about iron sulfur clusters uh, for, for the sake of students who are listening to the talk, um, their importance and, and what all biogenesis systems are um, available for making iron sulfur clusters. Um, also, I'm going to talk about iron sulfur cluster regulation in MTB. And there I'm going to talk about uh, the role of a transcription factor so far, which contains four and four sulfur clusters, and how this transcription factor is a key transcription regulator of iron sulfur cluster biogenesis in TB. And also, finally, um, I'm going to talk about a protein, SUFT, uh, for which there is no real information available. It also contains a domain of unknown function, uh, which signifies that the function is not known. So we sort of um, provided some very uh, interesting insight about the function of this protein. And function is related to iron sulfur cluster maturation. 
So before we move further, iron sulfur clusters are the most ancient kind of um, iron sulfur cluster, uh, you know, cofactors which are available. Um, most of the organism, all of the organisms in all three kingdoms of life have iron sulfur cluster containing proteins. They carry out range of function, uh, you know, from metabolism to respiration. So they are very, very critical. And that sort of uh, tells you that, um, you know, there is a whole hypothesis about iron sulfur cluster world which is linked to the origin of life. It's, it's very interesting if you look at uh, from the perspective of evolution and origin of life, um, you know, billions of years ago, about 4 billion years ago or so, uh, if you know the environment of, 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 of the earth, environment is most, mostly anaerobic and, you know, it was rich. It was, it was very high in temperature, pressure, ultraviolet radiation. Um, under those conditions, uh, how life evolved was really a challenging question, and nobody has really, uh, really good understanding of the processes which led to evolution of life and current modern modern day life. So there is a whole hypothesis of iron sulfur cluster world, you know, and it appears that under uh, under the anaerobic environment and the environment of high temperature and high pressure. Uh, once this high temperature and high pressure sort of start reducing and uh, ocean starts to cool down, um, it appears that uh, two of the you know atoms, iron and sulfur, which are very much available uh, you know uh, in that environment, reduced form of iron and hydrogen sulfide is a sole of sole source of sulfur was really in abundance, and in that environment there there appears to be self assembly of iron and sulfur to form something called as pyrite. And these self-assembled iron and sulfur uh, molecules, this, this assembly was able to, this complex was able to carry out a lot of, you know, reactions like nitrogen friction, reduction of carbon and all those things. So it appears that this self-assembled iron and sulfur complex was the starting point of life. And it was, it sort of provided template on which protein is started to, you know, um, assemble. And as we move from oxygen anaerobic environment, reduced highly reduced environment to a slightly oxygen rich environment, we see that these self assembled iron sulfide sulfur molecules were sort of surrounded by uh, simple peptides, simple proteins of five to six amino acids like ferredoxin. Ferredoxin is the earliest, you know, if you look at evolutionary tra trajectory, ferredoxin seems to be the earliest protein which came into nature. And this ferredoxin. Um, and then for duplication of ferrodoxin takes place. So now if you look at ferrodoxin, which is present in mitochondria in bacterial system is about 12 to 13 kilodaltons. So, so this ferrodoxin seems to be the earliest protein. And as we move further uh, and we oxygen become more and more available due to photosynthesis like event, uh, the thing which happened is that there is sort of, uh, you know, bioavailability of oxygen seems to be reduced because, you know, once a bioavailability of iron seems to be reduced because you know, once iron uh, gets oxidized to Fe3 plus state, it is not really available. It gets leased out, precipitated, and therefore uh, assembly of iron sulfur clusters was not possible. So under that oxygen rich environment, then organism evolved to then form uh, dedicated iron sulfur cluster assembly systems, which are able, able to sequester iron in a bioavailable form, which are able to acquire sulfur from cysteine and then assemble iron sulfur clusters in a manner that it is no longer, you know, it is sensitive to oxygen, but, you know, these assembly systems were able to protect it. And these assembly systems are present in all three kingdoms of life now, and, you know, in our mitochondria, in, in, in bacterial system, in, in all, all plants, plant states, chloroplasts, everywhere. So this is how uh, sort of progression of life takes place, and iron sulfur cluster seems to play a very, very important role. Uh, and this is, this is another very interesting observation. So if you look at the content of iron in, in deep oceans, uh, when early life form evolved, you know, if you look at 4 billion years ago, and if you look at the iron content in the deep ocean, iron content was about millimolar concentration of iron, bioavailable reduced form of iron. And oxygen was very, very less. But as you move from 4 billion years to, to now, you know, uh, towards the modern era, you will see that oxygen is started to go up because of photosynthesis activity, and then iron is started to go down. And nowadays, you hardly find any bioavailable iron. Iron availability is probably in low nanomolar range. And with this, there, there is a certain evolutionary uh, mechanisms which takes place in organisms. Um, and I'm going to talk, talk about the system a little later, but just to give you an example, 
when oxygen was less and you have high bioavailability of iron and sulfide, these molecules, these atoms can come inside the cells where they can, um, they can be assembled by very simpler proteins like SUF B and SUF C to form iron sulfur clusters. But as the iron become more uh, unavailable because of oxidation events, you know, and sulfur also become un unavailable because now there is a lot of inorganic sulfate in the environment. You see, you need a dedicated system that convert inorganic sulfur into cysteine by reductive sulfur assimilation pathway. And that cysteine is then taken up by cysteine desulfurase to give you sulfur for iron sulfur cluster assembly. Similarly, iron is transported by dedicated transporters, and then this iron is sequestered um, by chaperons and is stored in ferritins, uh, which probably is the source of iron for iron sulfur cluster assembly. As we become more and more oxidized, there are some specialized proteins which are acquired by organisms to protect iron sulfur cluster assembly from hydrogen peroxide and oxygen mediated destruction. So, um, you know, iron sulfur clusters, uh, they come into different flavors. However, um, you know, the most common type of iron sulfur clusters are two iron two sulfur clusters and four iron four sulfur clusters. And you can see that you have two irons and two sulfide uh, ligands. And then iron is also coordinated by cysteine sulfur. So for two iron two sulfur, you need uh, this kind of arrangement. For four iron four sulfur cluster, you will need cysteines and sulfide ligand, and you will see a cuboidal kind of symmetry. Now these iron sulfur clusters are uh, ligated to proteins. And these proteins carry out different reactions because of the fact that iron sulfur iron uh, can get oxidized and reduced. These are excellent uh, mediators of electron transfer. These proteins, like ferrodoxins, they are also molecular switches for gene regulation. If a DNA binding protein contains iron sulfur cluster, oxidation state of iron sulfur cluster or presence or absence of iron sulfur cluster can regulate DNA binding pro properties and thereby changes the gene regulation profile of transcription factors. Um, these enzymes also carry out radical enzymes. They are radical enzymes. They also carry out direct synthesis. For example, synthesis of cofactors like biotin and lipoic acid is dependent on protein like biotin synthase and lipoyl synthase, which are iron sulfur cluster proteins. Similarly, enzyme aconitase, which I'm sure every one of uh, you have heard about. Aconitase is a, a gatekeeper enzyme for TCA cycle, which converts citrate to isocitrate, and therefore, Aconitase activity is also dependent on the presence of 4 and 4 sulfur cluster. So a lot of these, you know, uh, function uh, are being carried out by iron sulfur cluster protein. They are, they are key for metabolism. They're key for respiration, gene regulation, electron transfer reaction. Therefore, they are actually most of the time, they're essential for most of the organisms which carry iron sulfur cluster proteins. Now, uh, the problem with iron sulfur cluster is that while they are essential for organism metabolism, survival, growth, respiration, uh, you know, they are also exceptionally sensitive for, uh, you know, getting damaged by reactive oxygen species and nitrogen intermediates. And this is a case of aconitase, where aconitase, one of the iron of aconitase is solvent exposed, and this can be directly targeted by reactive oxygen species, peroxynitrite with a very high rate constant, and this iron can be released in active form of aconitase is 3 iron 4 sulfur. And once iron is released, it can participate in Fenton chemistry to give you hydroxyl radical. Fe2 plus, if you have H2O2 around, will give you hydroxyl radical. And the hydroxyl radical is, is one of the most potent, um, you know, uh, oxidative radical that can damage DNA, lipids, and protein, and can actually be very deleterious for organisms. So it's a very unique situation where uh, you need iron sulfur cluster for your own metabolism, respiration, and growth. But because it is very sensitive to um, redox-mediated damage, uh, it's a situation like enemy within where, you know, if there is uncontrolled ROS around or, uh, you know, uh, deregulation of iron sulfur cluster biogenesis, uh, you will see Fenton chemistry playing, in, playing, playing its part and it can generate hydroxyl radical to damage. Um, lipids and protein and DNA. Therefore, it's very important for us uh, to understand how these iron sulfur clusters synthesis and repairs are regulated, what are the biogenesis pathways, and how cells actually sense when they need to repair iron sulfur cluster, when they need to synthesize it so that they can overcome uh, the damage caused by deleterious redox mediated events. Um, so some of the common iron sulfur cluster biogenesis pathways in a bacterial system, because we are going to talk about microbacteria. So I'm going to focus my talk in, on bacteria. 
but these iron sulfur cluster biogenesis mechanisms are also present in humans and mammalian systems and yeast and all. Um, and more or less, their functionality remains the same. Some of these component changes. For example, in E. coli, you will find uh, a multi protein operons, a multigenic uh, operon, which uh, produce a lot of these proteins that are involved in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis, like ICS is one of the system, SOF is another system, and CSD. Um, if you compare with mycobacterium tuberculosis, if you compare E. coli and mycobacterium tuberculosis, MTB has actually uh, reduced its iron sulfur cluster biogenesis reportier, and it actually have only one iron sulfur cluster biogenesis system, SOF system, which is one full iron sulfur cluster biogenesis system, although it also has a variation. This protein SOF U is actually a, a close homolog of ICSU, so there is some atypical mix and match kind of arrangement in case of MTB. And MTB also has the ICS system, but if you compare with E. coli, where ICS system contain number of these genes, uh, in case of MTB, it is restricted to only one gene ICSS, which encodes for 16 D cell furase. Now, how these protein come together and work, more or less, it's an assembly line kind of approach, and you know, component might change here and there, but the approach remains same. For example, it will start with the release of sulfur from cysteine. And this function is actually executed by cysteine D sulfurase encoded by ICS, NIFS, or SOFS. And once sulfur is released and iron is around, you will see that um, iron sulfur clusters are being formed on scuff fold proteins. And these are the proteins which forms the which gives you the plate form. It gives organism a plate form to assemble iron sulfur cluster. And these are encoded by SOF BCD in case of SOF system and ICS U in case of ICS system. And once iron sulfur clusters are assembled, they are then transferred to carrier protein like SUF A, ICS A, and ERP A. And from carrier protein, um, they are then uh, you know, given to client protein, which are the iron sulfur cluster proteins like aconitase, succinate dehydrogenase, and lipoic acid synthase. And this, this reaction is actually uh, energy dependent. And here you need chaperons and ATP to then transfer um, iron, pre, pre synthesized iron sulfur cluster to the client protein. So this scheme more or less remains same uh, in, in different organisms. And it's a very carefully choreographed uh, mechanisms. Any deregulation of these components would lead to uh, you know, abnormal synthesis of iron sulfur cluster leads to iron you know, toxic uh, polysulfide accumulations. Therefore, the system needs to be very, very carefully regulated. <clears throat> Why do we need it in TB? Because you know um, we are studying in tuberculosis, and we believe that we need to study this in tuberculosis because of one of the most important reasons is that MTB, Mycobacterium tuberculosis causative agent of TB, actually encounters a lot of um, immune pressures and environmental uh, stresses, which are known to damage iron sulfur clusters. For example, oxygen. There's the gradient of oxygen in TB infected lungs. We are, uh, you know, uh, at the lower lobe of your lungs, uh, you know, you have tuberculosis in a dormant form in a closed cavity, and then you have active lesions in the upper lobe of the lung, and there is a differential oxygen pressure here. So you will see high oxygen pressure at, at the upper lobe of lung, and there are chances that iron sulfur cluster might get damaged inside MTB. Similarly, when you look at, um, you know, activated macrophages, for example, where MTB is exposed to low level of iron, and iron being one of the requirements for iron sulfur cluster. If you have low level of iron, it will be difficult for cells to maintain iron sulfur clusters. pH, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen in, uh, species, peroxy nitride, they all are known to target iron sulfur clusters. And despite the fact that MTB is exposed to these stresses, which are known to target iron sulfur clusters, they are able to persist in this environment, which tells you that MTB has a very, uh, it has a mechanism to sense the requirement of iron sulfur cluster when the demand is high, when the demand is low, and then regulates this iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. Um, also to mention you that, you know, about uh, MTB contain about 50 iron sulfur cluster proteins, 70% of them are involved in respiration, about 10% in metabolism, and uh, some of these proteins, YB family specifically are four and four sulfur cluster containing transcription factors, which are required for MTB adaptation in response to variety of stresses, including nitric oxide, 
low pH reactive oxygen species and antibiotics. So, so seems like MTB uh, is uh, you know um, relying on iron sulfur cluster proteins for its respiration metabolism as well as stress response. And as I said, it has one complete system to sense or uh, to actually uh, met, meet the demands of iron sulfur cluster, and it is called a SUF system. And uh, SUF system is quite unique. Uh, here it is, uh, if you look at SUF system, except the first gene of the operon, rest of the genes are uh, essential. You cannot knock them out. First gene of the operon seems to have a homology with DNA binding transcription regulator. Uh, homology wise, it appears that it also, it's going to bind iron sulfur cluster also. So this seems to be a very, very interesting protein to, to study, mm -hmm. to find out whether this uh, transcription regulator is the regulator or coordinator of or regulator of this whole operon, so operon, and also regulate iron sulfur cluster homeostasis and MTB. So with this in mind, uh, two postdocs in the lab decided to work on this operon. Uh, Kushi has started to working on SUF system way back in 2016 or so, 17. And Ashutosh, uh, he picked up the last enzyme of the operon, SUF T. And the reason was that all the other proteins are more, more or less, we know that what they are going to do based on the studies done in other organisms and some of the work done in mycobacteria also. But for SUF T, we had no idea. And nobody has a clue what it is doing and what it, why it is present along with other iron sulfur cluster biogenesis uh, you know, proteins. So first, I'm going to tell you about so far, And then I'm going to, in the next part, I'm going to tell you about <coughs> SUF T. So um, SUF R, um, you know, as a homology search, based on the homology search, and I think before our paper could publish, there are some publications to show that so far is a iron sulfur cluster protein. So we first characterize the iron sulfur cluster of so far, and the way we characterize is that we um, use a modified method to, to actually uh, allow iron sulfur cluster formation inside E. coli grown under anaerobic environment. So we didn't do any purification under aerobic condition. We do, did not do any reconstitution of iron sulfur cluster. We have cultured E. coli in a condition where uh, proper assembly of iron sulfur cluster can take place. And under anaerobic condition, we isolated iron sulfur cluster and here, when we did UV with spectra of purified iron sulfur cluster containing so far, um, you will see that there is a characteristic peak of 4 and 4 sulfur cluster, which is present in the protein. And we were able, so this is 420 nanometer shoulder, which is very characteristic of 4 and 4 sulfur cluster proteins. You can uh, treat this protein with dithionite, and which leads to the leaching of iron sulfur cluster. Uh, and, and the loss of color, and that's very characteristic of redox responsive iron sulfur cluster. We also expose, uh, you know, um, our holo so far, which is four iron four sulfur cluster protein to H2O2, one millimolar. And in a time dependent manner, you see the loss of peak, which corresponds to four iron four sulfur cluster. It, because H2O2 is known to damage iron sulfur clusters, and you will see a complete loss of iron sulfur cluster by 20 minutes in response to one millimolar H2O2. Furthermore, iron sulfur clusters are also reactive to another, um, you know, uh, uh, gas, nitric oxide, which is produced by uh, macrophages uh, via in inducible nitric oxide synthase. Um, this nitric oxide uh, can, so we, what, we, what, what we did in this experiment, we have treated um, iron sulfur cluster form of so far with uh, proline nonate, which is a fast releasing nitric oxide donor. And here, nitric oxide replaces um, sulfide ligand of iron sulfur cluster with NO, and you form a DNIC, denitrosyl iron dithiol complex, which is very, very toxic complex if it forms inside uh, cells. And you will see that in the spectra wise, it's very easy to characterize. This is the spectra of a holoform iron sulfur cluster protein, four and four sulfur clusters so far. When you treat with nitric oxide, you will, you will see that the, this spectral feature gradually lost in a time dependent manner, and you will see an increase in shoulder around 315 or 350, which, which, which with a clear isobastic point. And this, this signifies the formation of DNIC on this protein. And we have verified this, uh, these structural changes by another sophisticated technique, EPR also. So having, having shown that SUF R is a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster protein, it can be, this iron sulfur cluster is sensitive to H2O2 and NO. We wanted to then ask the question how it regulates its DNA binding property. And for that, we have taken the promoter fragment of SUF operon itself because we wanted to understand if SUFA regulates its own expression. Expression is of the SUF operon involved in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. 
So um, the first experiment which we have done, we have done an IMSA experiment uh, where we have incubated a holo form of protein, which is four and four sulfur cluster form of so far with, with the DNA fragment. And here you will see that a nice complex being formed. And then when you treat this protein with increasing concentration of H2O2, you will see that the DNA binding is lost, which tells you that when so far is getting converted between uh, from holo form to apo form, uh, the DNA binding ability is lost. Similarly, if you look at nitric oxide, you see a similar data. Without nitric oxide, holo form of so far is able to bind DNA. And in response to nitric oxide, you don't see any binding. So DNA binding is also lost when iron sulfur cluster 4, Fe4 sulfur cluster converts to DNIC. How does it affect transcription? So we did in vitro transcription assay where we have incubated this promoter fragment with RNA polymerase in the presence or absence of APO and holo form of of so far. And here you would see that this is the single transcript which is originating from the soft promoter. And you would see that uh, if you use iron sulfur cluster containing so far increasing concentration, you see that the transcript is reduced, which, mean, which means that holo so far is a repressor of its own expression, of the expression of a so -popiron. If you take away iron sulfur cluster and then you do in vitro transcription assay, you don't see any repression. Repression is gone which means that holo form of sulfur which binds to DNA represses transcription, whereas apo form of sulfur which does not have iron sulfur cluster, it derepresses the expression. And nitric oxide treated sulfur also, you would see that gradually it derepresses uh, transcription. So it's very, very clear that it is a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a transcription factor where its activity is regulated by the presence or absence of iron sulfur cluster. We also did foot, uh, DNA is one footprinting assay uh, with, with the same promoter fragment. And here also you can see that as compared to uh, the lane which does not contain so far, if you keep increasing so far, you see a nice footprint here in, uh, with, with, with both the strand. And we could, if we could able to find out uh, a perfect palindrome uh, with, to which so far binds. Um, and I you know we have done experiment where we have mutated, mutated these repeats, inverted repeats, and we found that DNA binding is lost. So, so the, these, these are really clean experiments where you could show that so far is a repressor, it binds to DNA in a four and four sulfur cluster form. And when iron sulfur cluster is not there, its ability to bind DNA and to repress transcription is abolished. <clears throat> Now we wanted to go, um, you know, we wanted to do perform genetic experiment to understand what is so far doing uh, in MTB and how MTB uh, metabolism and MTB virulence is affected by the presence or absence of so far. So uh, as I have shown uh, in my earlier slide, so far is the first gene of the operon. Rest of the operon seems to be essential. You cannot knock it out, but you can knock out first gene. And uh, there are several groups um, which were able to knock out the first gene of, um, of this operon, including um, Amit Pandey's group at THSTI. And here um, you uh, have, so we have been able to knock it out. And what we found very strangely that, um, you know, with knockout of so far, we don't, we, we do see expression of rest of the operon, but we don't see NO inducibility. This whole operon gets very high induced in response to nitric oxide in MTB, and it's known before our study. But what we found that if you uh, create, if you disrupt so far, while basal expression of sofoperon is maintained, uh, NO inducibility was not there. So this, this mutant was actually a, a really clean tool for us to understand the role of iron sulfur cluster homeostasis mediated by soap system in, 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 in MTB's response to nitric oxide. So the first question we ask is that how does nitric oxide affect iron sulfur cluster homeostasis in MTB and what is the role of so far? And as a proxy for, uh, for this assay, we have used aconitase. Aconitase is an iron sulfur cluster enzyme. It's a gatekeeper enzyme which, which, which regulates this cycle. Um, aconitase has a four iron four sulfur cluster, which is sensitive to nitric oxide. That information was already available. So the experiment we have done here is that we have um, you treated wild type MTB here to deteno, which is a nitric oxide donor, and we monitored aconitase activity over time. Aconitase levels were not affected by nitric oxide. And here you can see that nitric oxide activity reduced from 100% to 50% by 12 hours. Very interestingly, 
if you then uh, remove nitric oxide and you reculture this bacteria, which was earlier exposed to nitric oxide, to nitric oxide free medium where there is no nitric oxide, uh, the activity is recovered. After you know you incubate for 12 more hours in detano free media, uh, you regain full activity in wild type MTBs, which means that iron sulfur cluster biogenesis or repair systems were active in wild type MTB, which leads to uh, recovery of echinitis activity. We repeated the same experiment with um, so far mutant, which does not have, which lacks anoinducibility of sofopiron. And here we found that we see a similar response where uh, echinitis activity goes down. But if you then culture bacteria, which is exposed to NO in an NO free media, we don't see this recovery response. So the mutant has lost his ability to repair iron sulfur cluster. Uh, in response to nitric oxide. And this is some of, one of the very interesting finding of, of this work. Um, we also figured it out that uh, so mutant, if you expose it to nitric oxide, it accumulates a lot of um, reactive oxygen species. And here you will see that with deterno, with cell rocks dye, uh, we see oxidation of this dye, indicating oxidative, more oxidative stress in MTB as compared to MTB so far mutant as compared to wild type MTB. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, respiration data, but we have also shown that uh, respiration or bioenergetics, oxi uh, oxidative phosphorylation also gets affected with nitric oxide and it gets more effective in, affected in, 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 in uh, so far mutant. So uh, uh, what about phenotype? And there, uh, you know, we did this experiment where we expose wild type MTB so far mutant and the complemented strain with nitric oxide. And we found that if you expose these um, mutant to nitric oxide, a detano, which is an donor, till about 2.5 millimolar, we actually don't see any difference in the strains. So, you know, uh, MTB seems to be able to tolerate a lot of nitric oxide, and at least with one dose of nitric oxide, so mutant seems to be giving us no phenotype. So we went back into the literature and we found one of the publications from Martin Voskis lab, where they have shown that uh, if you repeatedly expose to nitric oxide, uh, about five to six doses every uh, six hours with 0 0.1 millimolar of nitric oxide, you are able to induce bacteriostasis. And NO is actually known to induce non-replication, non-replicating persistence. So if you look at wild type MTB here, and you expose this wild type MTB to six doses of nitric oxide every six hours, you will see that um, you know after this exposure, uh, it takes about seven days for, for a wild type MTB to recover. Uh, leave aside this panel because this is untreated, but NO treated one, you will see that MTB takes about seven days to recover from six doses of NO before you know it, it remain sort of non-growing in a non-growing state. However, in case of MTB so far mutant, it takes about 14 days to recover from NO. So it seems that so far mutant has 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 a characteristic defect in. Uh, coming out um, of NO mediated bacteriostasis. Complemented strain for some reason we did not work for us. And uh, the reason was that because this whole operon, NO inducibility of operon was affected because of, um, you know, so far knockout and because of polar mutations. Therefore, we don't see a complementation in our experiment so, so far. Uh, we finally, we did animal experiments where we, uh, and this, this animal experiment is actually very similar to what uh, Amit Pandey has shown in THTI, where um, they also figured it out that mutant is defective in persistence. We also found the same thing, but we found that this persistence is actually dependent on nitric oxide. If you take away nitric oxide, and these are INOS defective animals, and you infect with wild type MTB and so far mutant, um, the attenuated phenotype is lost. So this this was the overall finding with so far. And based on this, we were able to uh, give us a model uh, which sort of indicate a negative feedback regulation by holo, you know, um, by so far. This sort of indicates that under normal growing condition, when there is sufficient iron around, when there is no requirement for iron sulfur cluster, so far it is present in an iron sulfur cluster form where it represses a uh, you know, any abnormal induction of so far. So, so you don't need iron sulfur cluster to, to be formed. So, so far it's, it's repressed here. When um, there is a stress, when MTB faces stress like nitric oxide, hydrogen peroxide, or peroxy nitride, that damages iron sulfur cluster. It also damages iron sulfur cluster so far, which is sort of a signal for so far 
to then derepresses the expression of um, the sofocron there is formation of uh, you know then because of induction of sofocron you will see more and more anion sulfur cluster formation most of the metabolic enzymes respiratory enzymes which require anion sulfur cluster their um, they their requirement is going to be fulfilled and once their requirement is satisfied iron sulfur clusters are again formed on holosulfur, which again could repress iron sulfur cluster. And this, this is a nice mechanism by which MTB could be able to sense these signals and regulate iron sulfur cluster homeostasis in MTB. So this is the first part. If there is any question about first part, I can take it now, Nishit, or I can take it at the end. Um, I think it, we can, we can uh, have question session after you finish. Your okay, process. great. Fine. All right. Um, okay. So, um, so the second part of uh, the talk, as I said, is on the last um, protein of, of um, the operon, which is SUFT. And SUFT is a very interesting protein because if you look at an E. coli in another organism, you don't find SUFT. However, it's not that it is not there. SUFT is there in, in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis operon, in Arabidopsis, in, in case of um, Staph aureus, so it is there, but the function was not really clear. And it, it appears that a SUFTI contains um, a domain called, called as do, domain of unknown function. Actually, if you look at uh, most of the genome sequence which are done in different organisms, about 20% of proteins contain domain of unknown function. And we really don't know um, what these proteins are doing. So from um, you know, genomic curation perspective also, it's important to identify the role of these proteins which contains domain of unknown function. And one of the thing which we figured it out by doing homology search searches with different organisms where um, these SOFTI kind of proteins are present, um, they are highly conserved. And one of the motive which is very, very conserved is this DPX-TC motif, uh, which is very conserved across uh, SOFTI homologs in different organisms. And cysteine is some, something which is strictly conserved. It is hyperactive cysteine, highly nucleophile. Uh, so these features were there in case of MTB SUFTI also. MTB SUFTI, um, NMR structure of SUFTI is already there in PDB database. So we were able to model this um, MTB SUFTI structure based on the uh, PDB entry. And we, we found that, um, you know, at least um, this conserved motif, DETC, uh, they seems to be, although they are, you know, in the structure, they are located very close by. Um, very interestingly, hydroxyl radical of DET, they actually orient towards each other. Cysteine is also very close by, so, and its thiol is also oriented towards hydroxyl. Uh, proline is next to cysteine, therefore it appears that it will be important. In a, I think this proline is going to play a very important role in in organizing cysteine in the structure. And this kind of structure where hydroxyl radicals are, where the hydroxyl group is facing each other and sulfidyl group of cysteine is also facing towards hydroxyl group of these amino acid, they sort of uh, tells you that there is a pocket which has been formed on the surface. And most often these pockets actually bind some ligands or metals or iron sulfur clusters. So, um, you know, we thought that one of the way MTB SUFTI can participate in iron sulfur cluster and which justify its uh, occurrence in, in the SUFT machinery is perhaps that it might also bind iron or iron sulfur cluster. So we checked, um, you know, we purified the protein the way we purified so far, and we did UV with the spectroscopy. We did not find any, um, you know, spectral features of iron sulfur clusters. We did um, iron estimation also, and there also we did not find any presence of any iron in, in, in SOFT. We have taken catalase as a heme containing protein as a positive control. You see a lot of iron there. Um, with both um, biochemical estimation and biophysical estimation, we did not find any iron in, in SOFT. We also mutated this hyperactive cysteine, could not find any iron invariant also. So it appears that SOFT perhaps at least in vitro does not really contain, um, you know, uh, iron or iron sulfur cluster. So then question comes, if that's true, how does it really participate in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis? So we looked into literature and we found that at least in yeast, um, there are um, proteins which are involved in um, iron sulfur cluster formation. They also contain domain of unknown function. And the way they uh, 
um, and actually studies are emerging now, the way they participate in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis is actually they interact with other iron sulfur cluster biogenesis proteins. And by way of physical interaction with, with the assembly protein, they help iron sulfur cluster assembly formation. Details are yet not known why, what is the importance of that interaction, but it appears that that interaction with other iron sulfur cluster machinery proteins is very, very important for, for their role in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. So as Nishid um, during the introduction sort of uh, alluded that um, during my postdoc, I had developed the system to measure, to, to sort of quantify protein-protein interaction inside microbacteria. We make use of the system in this study also. And the reason we did this because there were some previous public publication using yeast 2 hybrid where it has been shown that SWIFT actually does not react, does not physically interact with any other SWIFT protein of sofopiron. So we thought that maybe using a native host would help. So we uh, use this uh, protein bacterial 2 hybrid system, which works for mycobacteria. And the system is based on murine dihydrofolate reductase, MDHFR, uh, which is an enzyme which you can split this enzyme into two uh, domain, F12, F3. And you can fuse your protein of interest, uh, two protein of interest in each domain. You know, you, for example, we want to, for example, we wanted to check whether SUFTI interact with SUFU. So we can clone SUFTI in, in uh, F12 with F12 fragment. We can fuse it covalently and SUFU with F3 fragment of murine DHFR. Now, if these two protein interact, if SUFTI interacts with SUFU, for example, they are going to bring these two DHFR fragment close together so that they can reconstitute in a three-dimensional structure and in an enzyme. Now, murine uh, dehydrofolate reductase uh, is going to only work when we are going to inhibit bacterial dehydrofolate reductase. Remember, DHFR is an essential enzyme and it is also present in mycobacteria. So um, we inhibit smigmatis DHFR by uh, an antibiotic called as trimethoprim. About you know, 25 to 12 to 50 microgram per ml of trimethoprim can actually inhibit mycobacterial DHFR. And then you can score for the assembly of murine DHFR. So you can see the resistance emerging to trimethoprim if murine DHFR is assembled due to physical interaction between the protein of interest. So this is a system which we used and where we check the interaction between SUFT and uh, SUFT with SUFT itself, homodimerization, SUFT with SUFT U and SUFT with SUFT S. So you can see that this, um, you know, this lane, which uh, this is, these are the trimethoprim containing pl uh, plates. Uh, this number two is a positive control. And here you will see that there is a strong interaction between SUFT and SUFT. So SUFT seems to be homodimerizing. Very interestingly, if you knock out hyper, if you, if you replace hyperactive cysteine from SUFT and then again study the interaction, you don't see interaction. So the physical interaction is actually dependent on the presence of cysteine. SUFT also interact with another uh, protein in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis pathway, SUFU. And this interaction is also seems to be dependent on cysteine because in this panel, you don't see any growth. And SUFT is also interacting with SUFS. SUFS is a cysteine D sulfurase that releases sulfur from cysteine for iron sulfur cluster formation. So it's very, very clear that SUFT is physically interacting with other SUF proteins um, in the um, SUFOPERON. We also figured it out that SUFT is also interacting with client protein. For example, we have taken SUFR and Aconitase. Both are poor iron for sulfur cluster proteins. And here also, if you look at SUFT in this panel one, is actually interacting with aquinitase. And this interaction is also dependent on the cysteine, presence of cysteine in SUFT. If you, if you replace the cysteine to alanine, you don't see any interaction. And same happens with SUFT and SUFR interaction. There is a strong interaction which is lost when cysteine is not there. So one of the way by which SUFT can participate in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis is by uh, interacting with other iron sulfur cluster biogenesis protein like SUF-S and SUF-U, and also with the client protein, which ultimately accepts iron sulfur clusters like Aconitase and SUFR. We have validated some of these inter interactions with in vivo pull downs also. Moving further, we wanted to know if what is the role of SIFT in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. And 
And as I told you, um, you know, SUFTI is essential. So for us to know the role of SUFTI in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis and repair in MTB, we need to somehow deplete this protein. And so we used a CRISPR system, uh, which, uh, you know, um, similar system which uh, Nishith has developed in THSCI. Here, um, you know, ATC based uh, depletion of SUFTI was achieved using CRISPR Cas9 system. And you can see a nice depletion of SUFTI with as low as 50 nanogram of ATC. And then we ask the question if we deplete SUFTI, what happens to iron sulfur cluster enzymes like aquinitase, to which it is phys physically interacting? And as you can see in this figure, we have measured SUFTI amount and aconitase activity in response to ATC from 50 to 200, where you see a, you know, a significant depletion of, of SUFTI, we see about 50% reduction in aconitase. So by reducing SUFTI activity, we are able to reduce the, by reducing the SUFTI levels, we are able to reduce the activity of aconitase. So it appears that, and, and this happens without affecting the protein level of aconitase, which means that SUFTI, absence of SUFTI is somehow derailing iron sulfur cluster formation of aconitase, which is essential for its activity and you don't see any activity. So the, this, this tells you that SUFTI or SUF system is required for the basal iron sulfur cluster, uh, you know, uh, for, for forming, forming iron sulfur clusters on, on, the, on the housekeeping enzymes. Without any stress, requirement of iron sulfur cluster is being fulfilled by SUF pathway and SUFTI is involved. The next question we asked is that what happens in response to stress, whether a uh, SUF system is able to repair iron sulfur clusters once it is damaged by the stresses. So here we have done this experiment in cell lysate of MTB, uh, where SUFT is sufficient and where we deplete, deplete a SUFT with an hydrotetracycline, uh, and then expose the cell lysate to H2O2 for two minutes and did aconitase assay. And you see about 50% reduction in aconitase. When which is known, H2O2 is known to damage aconitase iron sulfur cluster. It is very sensitive to H2O2. And then what we did is that if you actually take care of this H2O2 by catalase, if you do the same experiment, but you add H2O2 and catalase, then you know you don't see this, uh, uh, you know, you, you remove H2O2 after H2O2 is damaging iron sulfur cluster, you remove H2O2 by catalase. Cell lysate is able to actually make iron sulfur cluster of aconitase and restore the activity of aconitase. So this was very striking. And if you look at SUFTI knockdown, knockdown is unable to, to repair iron sulfur cluster once H2O2 is removed by catalase, which tells you that the appropriate level of SUFTI is perhaps required for formation of iron sulfur cluster in aconitase. So, so the activity of SUFTI and by extension, SUFOPERON would be required for both housekeeping function and also repairing iron sulfur cluster in response to stress. We moved on because aconitase is, is a major enzyme that regulates TC cycle. And uh, not only aconitase, there are several iron sulfur cluster containing enzymes that are key to metabolism. For example, pyruvate dehydrogenase, where pyruvate dehydrogenase subunit are dependent, their activity is dependent on lipoic acid. Lipoic acid comes from lipoic synthase enzyme, which is the iron sulfur cluster protein. So if SUF system is responsible for making iron sulfur cluster of lipoic synthase, then you would see defect in pyruvate dehydrogenase. Similarly, you will see defect in succinate dehydrogenase, which is a 4 and 4 sulfur cluster containing enzyme. So we have done a steady state metabolite estimation of wild type MTB and MTB when SUFTI is depleted, and then try to figure it out where all SUF system is playing a role. And rightly so, it is, seems to be very, very, uh, you know, very uh, important for regulating TC cycle metabolite. You can see that if aconitase is not working, you will see accumulation of citrate, right, uh, here, because this step is inhibited and you see alpha ketoglutarate is going down. Similarly, you know, succinate dehydrogenase, if the defect is here because of iron sulfur cluster, you will see accumulation of succinate, which we see, and, uh, you know, uh, and also pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is dependent on lipoic acid, here also we see accumulation of pyruvate um, in, in metabolomics analysis. We also figured it out that many methyl cycle intermediates like as the adenosine methionine, SAH, are also down in the mutant. And one of the reason it could be is that um, there is an enzyme called as APS reductase, CISH, which convert inorganic sulfate to cysteine. And that cysteine goes into homocysteine and methionine pathway by transsulfuration. 
the sole actin phenylene cycle is dependent on the flux of uh, sulfur to homocysteine via reductive sulfur assimilation pathway. And this um, enzyme is a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster enzyme. If it is not there, active methyl cycle is not going to function. And this, this seems to be very interesting because uh, methane and metabolism and a proper functioning of active methyl cycle is, seems to be essential for MTB. So that, that also seems to be deregulated in case of SUFTI mutant. So there is a widespread metabolic derailment in, in SUFTI mutant if you don't have or if you have depleted level of SUFTI mediated iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. Uh, we've checked respiration status also because many of the respiratory enzymes like NADS dihydrogenase, succinate dihydrogenase, they are iron sulfur cluster proteins. So we measured oxygen consumption rate of SUFTI depleted strain as compared to wild type. And uh, here also, uh, using um, this uh, seahorse analyzer, which is very common now, uh, you can see that while wild type uh, MT is, MTB is able to respire nicely, uh, SUFTI mutant, SUFTI depleted strain shows basal defect in respiration. Also, in response to INO4, when you decouple oxidation to phosphorylation and then cell tries to use all whatever reserve capacity of respiration they have to maintain OCR you see that M SUFTI knockdown strain, which is this blue line, has a reduced ability to maintain respiration. We also see slowdown of glycolysis, which means that overall metabolism is slowed down in case of um, you know, a SUFTI knockdown. And cells are towards more quiescent type rather than active energetic types. So overall, uh, iron sulfur cluster formed by SUFTI system seems to be important for metabolism and respiration of MTB. We did then, uh, you know, analysis on what is the consequence of not having SUFTI on in vitro growth, growth of MTB in macrophages and in animals. And here you can see that as expected, because it's an essential enzyme, as you deplete SUFTI, bacteria is not growing in liquid media as well as in plates. In, in macrophages also, if you deplete SUFTI, it's not growing at all. In animals, in mice, wherever you deplete SUFTI by doxycycline, you see there is a dip in bacterial survival. So, you know, doxycycline exp experiment is quite uh, crucial in animals because, you know, of stability issues and all, you don't see very high, large number of difference, but I think it's a very clear cut significant difference. As soon as you add the doxycycline within seven to 14 days, you, you start seeing very nice uh, growth defect. Pathology defect also, you can see that when you deplete it, uh, you know, you have a clean pathology because bacillary load is cleared up as compared to SUFTI sufficient strain. So uh, having shown this, this is all published data now, some of the data which is unpublished in two slides, I'm going to finish it off. Um, you know, anybody could ask, why do we need two system? If SUFT system on its own seems to be capable to taking care of MTB housekeeping requirement, as well as, uh, you know, stress response, why do we need ICS? And that is the system, that's the question which we are working in the lab right now. We are trying to understand why MTB required two, you know, iron sulfur cluster biogenesis system. Although ICS system is restricted to only one enzyme, um, you know, we, I have shown in my postdoc and followed by Stewart Cole's lab, they have shown that ICS uh, 16 desulfurase, one protein is sufficient to make iron sulfur clusters in MTB. And they have also used aconitase as a model enzyme to show it. So we asked the question, why do we need two systems? So we are working on this question and I'm going to show you only two data to um, very interesting unpublished data which sort of uh, bothers us also what, why it is we need two systems. And this is an animal experiment with the ICS mutant. This mutant is attenuated in whatever stress condition you give in vitro. Also in macrophages, mutant is not growing at all. It's super sensitive to all kinds of stresses. Even without stress, in normal aerobic media, growth is only 50% as compared to wild type. But you put this mutant in animals, mutant is hypervirulent. You know, at 28 days and 56 days, you see hypervirulence. We see partial complementation. Pathology is also severe in mutant, whether you take gross pathology as compared to wild type and complemented strain, or histopathology mutant is hypervirulent. So we thought of ask the question whether this hypervirulence is perhaps because of deregulated expression of sufoperon. And this is, a, this is something which we are working on. But what we did, we created a suf S knockdown in ICS. So it's kind of double knockout where ICS is not there. And then you uh, do a doxycycline mediated knockdown of suf S and do animal experiment where after 21 days of um, you know, infection, we then provided doxycycline and looked at the phenotype. 
and you will see this is very interesting. You will see this this is wild type MTP, this purple line, and then you will see this uh, you know uh, this line of ICS mutant, which shows very nice hypervirulence at 21 days and 42 days. Now, at after 21 days of infection, if you put doxycycline to reduce the expression of SOF system in ICS mutant, you see this hypervirulence is almost lost. It reaches to the level of wild type MTB. SOFS knockdown, as we know, SOF system is attenuated. If, if you do only SOFS knockdown, it is attenuated. But the hypervirulence of ICS comes back to the normal wild type intermediate levels if you knock down SOFS. So which sorts of tells you that SOF system might be deregulated in ICS mutant inside animals. We don't have evidence of deregulated SOF system in the mutant in vitro, but we, we are yet to find out whether it happens in, in, in the complex environment of animals. This is the gross pathology, which you see that ICS mutant, which shows hypervirulence, destructive pathology. If you knock down SOFS as ICS mutant, you are able to restore intermediate level of virulence. And same is the data with the histopathology. So with this, I'm going to conclude that in the second part, we have been able to show you that uh, one of the proteins, SUFT of SUF system, which contain domain of unknown function, perhaps work as the accessory proteins in iron sulfur cluster maturation. Uh, details are yet not known, but it appears that it physically interacts with other accessory proteins, which might help in making iron sulfur cluster. Um, SUFT is required for both maintaining iron sulfur cluster activity during normal growth and also um, under condition where the demand of iron sulfur cluster is high, for example, oxidative stress, low or low iron, where both iron sulfur clusters are going to be you know, damaged, SUFT seems to be required for repairing those iron sulfur cluster also. And lastly, deficiency of SUFT adversely affect respiration, metabolism, growth inside macrophages. Finally, um, this last line is, this is the thing which we are working now, where we feel that both ICS and SOF system is actually required by MTB to maintain intermediate degree of virulence so that it can persist for long term. So with this, um, I would like to um, thank all of you for your attention and also you know, all my funding agency for supporting me uh, generously for a very long time. Uh, this is my uh, group. This is a new crop. All my senior students have left the lab, and these are mostly new students working on different problems of TB, HIV, and SARS-CoV-2 uh, with some excellent collaborators. I would like to thank all of them. And with this, I'm really grateful to Nishi, to THSTI, to all of all my friends at THSTI for giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you, and I'll be very, very happy to answer any question if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit. Uh, it is really, uh, you know, Nice talk. Uh, I will say that you have educated us the basics of the iron sulfur cluster metabolism in mycobacterium, which is very difficult pathogen to understand. And I hope that uh, this would have helped, uh, you know, a lot of us in understanding the basics of iron sulfur cluster. So before I ask any question, I would like uh, others whether they have any question to do for you. Sure. Yes, sir, please. So Amit, thank you very much for an excellent talk, which I I can you know, tell you that I couldn't understand most of it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, no, 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 it's fine. But, you know, I was very fascinated by the your opening slides where you showed how evolutionarily iron and sulfur came together and with the help of peptide formed this kind of pterodoxin and then the other complexes uh, with the availability of oxygen and, uh, you know, uh, less availability of free iron. That's what you mentioned. My question is that, the way you showed and the way you described, it looks it was by design. Is it by design or it is, you know, uh, accidental? Because if you are saying it is by design, then there is something, uh, someone who is doing it. <laughs> it's more of a philosophical question. So, right. So that's what I'm saying. So, the, you know, what happens in science is that when events happen, we retrospectively try and explain them the right. way we understand things. Right, right. Yes. So it is quite possible that with the with the events unfolding over millions and millions of years, right. this is how it must have happened. Yeah, it, it, it's a hypothesis, more of a theory, you know, and there are a lot of people who are against it. It's a very fascinating also. theory. I mean, I'm sure many of these things uh, in other fields and other complexes must have occurred. Yes, yes. I mean... Uh, you know, the reason that uh, the bioavailability of iron, you know, you cannot, it's not contested under anaerobic condition, you will have in deep oceans and all high concentration of iron. 
and hydrogen sulfide was also around. So, uh, you know, this self assembly of iron and sulfur is going to take place. I don't think anybody doubts that. Uh, that pyrite formation and pyrite you can actually synthesize in the lab now also under these conditions um, and which can carry out different reactions uh, involving nitrogen fixation, fixation and, and carbon reduction. So that's nobody would context, but how from there to peptides and evolution of this such a sophisticated system takes place uh, is very difficult to explain, but it appears that it is happening and is, is present in all three kingdoms of life. It's not selective or, or for one over other. Um, Just first last question. So if this were to be a target for some kind of therapy, mm -hmm. and as you said, it is essential for mycobacterium, yeah. uh, what, what do you foresee as side effects of that targeted therapy in humans? Yeah, so uh, so uh, so that's a very good question. But uh, so, so the soup system, although you have iron sulfur cluster assembly system in humans also, soup system seems to be uh, you know it doesn't have any similarity in, in terms of you know three dimensional structure and all. So and for that reason, protein like soup tea, which is involved in iron sulfur cluster maturation and doof domain, so we are very interesting target where you can develop inhibitors without affecting mammalian counterparts. Actually, there are, I think, a couple of papers where they were able to find out plant-derived alkaloids, which was very specifically target SOFT of mycobacterium tuberculosis without having any toxicity on mammalian system. So uh, I think a uh, platform is, is there now, at least targeting SOFT system, targeting protein-protein interaction of SOFT system might give you some specific hotspot where you can target with novel inhibitors without... Uh, you know, affecting mammalian uh, side of iron sulfur cluster homeostasis. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So um, we have another question uh, which is written in the chat box. So the question is that can SUFTI knockout, knockdown strain be hypersensitive to drugs like bedaquiline targeting biogenetics in mycobacterium tuberculosis? Yeah, so, uh, so, so that's uh, a good, very good question. Uh, we have not done it. We have done um, drug sensitivity analysis with um, ICS mutant, and ICS mutant seems to be sensitive to beta -colin. However, double knockdown, double knockout, we, we are yet to do. My, I, you know, so there could be two possibility. One is that it might be very sensitive to these some of these antibiotics. Other possibility is that because you don't have iron sulfur clusters. Uh, you are going to affect respiration, you're going to affect proton motifors, and some of the drugs, uh, you know, at least in case of aminoglycosides, their transport inside the cell is dependent on proton motifors. And if you don't have, uh, you know, if your respiration is derailed, PMF is derailed, you may not be able to transport those, anti uh, those antibiotics, and you may find resistance also. So this is something which we need to, uh, you know, which we have to do. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Does iron sulfur cluster system exist in other bacteria like Salmonella? They are there. I mean, I, as I said in my opening slide, iron sulfur cluster systems are there in all three kingdoms of life, in all organisms, be it Salmonella, Staph, E. coli, Arabidopsis, you, you name it, you will find uh, some of these kind of systems. Either you will find ICS system or you will find soup system or you will find both. There is also a NIF system, which is a, which is present in azotobacter for nitrogen fixation and all. So um, it's there, everywhere it's there. Yeah. Okay, I think Amit Pandey has a question. Amit, mm -hmm. you can ask. Amit, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, um, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Amit, uh, excellent talk. Uh, no, as always, uh, I enjoy your science. So first of all, I, I, I don't think I have a question, but comments, I think, uh, we also worked on this, but uh, you have taken the iron sulfur cluster to a very different level and uh, excellently mechanistically explained the uh, persistence phenotype. So my other comment was, what is your take on this? Uh, we also have at least two or three mutants. I'm surprised that they are totally, uh, they weird, behave very weirdly in vitro system, but when you put them in animal models, they are hypervalent. So do you think it is something to do with, uh, I mean, uh, or no, so, and maybe getting something from the host that was missing and overgrowing. So, so just wanted you. So that uh, could be one possibility, Amit, that um, 
so if, for if you are saying that they are selectively taking something from the host then mutant has to take selectively right while time remains same your mutant has to selectively acquire something and that will happen only when i don't know how it will happen yeah so i mean something uh, difficult to think in case uh, of yeah autotrophies are in vitro you can see this but surprisingly when you put them in animals and you start uh, i have yeah. to repeat these experiments because sometimes it was uh, you know very difficult right. to explain how how to correlate this in vitro and in vivo phenotype no no i i totally agree with it they are very so mostly if you are dealing with metabolic enzymes and uh, some of the enzymes that are involved in essential pathways you can find out all sort of phenotypes for me <clears throat> in, in case of uh, our mutant ics mutant which is hypervirulent specifically in animals it appears to me that you know um, these iron sulfur cluster pathways so for an ics um, you know uh, their induction is dependent on environmental signal and it appears that when ics is not there bacteria would rely on so but that reliance is going to be much more when uh, host environment is there for example i would say that in case of in vivo environment you might have peroxynitrite which which we have not checked in vitro which yeah. probably uh, is affecting ics mutant to a to a is i mean to a level where a soft system is hugely induced you know yes. some kind of deregulation which has happened yeah and therefore because of that abnormal induction of cystic soft system we see hypervirulence that could be one possibility second possibility is that under that environmental condition ics may be the main protein involved in making iron sulfur cluster of soft r you know mm -hmm. so if ics is not there you will see uh, so far abnormally produced much more in 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 vivo and um, you know that could also lead to some i know these experiments are tough and <laughs> you have right you so, have to but at uh, least i think uh, our animal data where we knocked down sofas in ics mutant and we brought down the hypervirulence to so tb levels actually yeah, tells the you that regulation hypothesis uh, i think there is something there that you have it's, it's very so tough the, yeah, yeah so have you done some clearance studies showing that they clear out faster than the wild type in animal models no i don't know whether we, they are going to clear out i think if we have sensitive animal they'll kill animal they are so hypervirulent i had some step uh, you, you're talking about double no 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 i'm talking about ics only so ICS, they might be think clearing out better yeah i don't know whether type. yeah i don't know it's not going to clear out i think it's going to be super and one last question amit yeah. your mallet seems to be a little uh, you know under what do you think happening there i i saw that mallet levels were down looks so like mallet uh, you you will see from fumarate right uh, by yeah. fumarase or so so i although fumarase in other organism is a iron sulfur cluster containing enzyme and that could explain mallet data in at least in case of mtb uh, mtb fumarase so so far whatever is discovered is not a iron sulfur cluster protein so unless there is a, another iron sulfur cluster containing fumarase it Because is yet to be discovered citrate accumulation the isocitrate might it might be triggered so was expecting higher mallet but it is what it is so yeah yeah so <laughs> we i mean we consistently see that data we also okay. saw that data in ics mutant metabolomics that our mallet level and fumarate levels are deregulated there seems to be a fumarase which probably is iron sulfur cluster protein i'm done amit thank you and yeah, thank you I enjoyed the talk Yeah. Okay, so we have a few more questions before uh, I open. So there's another question: How does these iron sulfur cluster biogenesis genes are expressed under latent dormancy, inducing conditions like hypoxia or granulomatous lesions? Yeah. So um, you know, <clears throat> under hypoxia, I don't think uh, there is any activation of so far. IC ICS gene per se does not transcriptionally get up or down response. in response to stress so it's not really transcriptionally regulated ics when it comes to soof it does respond to most of the signals and the highest activation we get in response to nitric oxide where you see uh, quite a lot of induction of the system and it remains induced for a very long time however in hypoxia is not really regulated so i would say that soof at least in response to no no induced persistence or non replication persistence may be dependent on soof system and that is something we have shown with our um, you know successive no exposure experiment where we are able to induce vector stasis in in mtb and then mtb recovers out of it when when you remove no 
but not the SOOP mutant. So I would say that uh, anodependent persistence is likely to be dependent on SOOP mediated islands of the cluster biogenesis. Okay, so uh, there's another question that, sir, did you do any interaction with other metal because other metal may also compete? Mm, no, that's a good question and uh, we have not done it. So that is something we, we should be doing. It, right? <clears throat> we focus more on iron because we wanted to make a connection with iron sulfur cluster. But, but, but you're right, we should have checked for other metals also. Yeah. So um, I think now I can take my question. So um, what I observed that, you know, in case of so far study, which you have shown, uh, you showed that in case of NO treatment, the uh, aconitase activity is uh, reduced in wild type. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, probably because, uh, you know, uh, your uh, the effect of so far is... Uh, alleviated because uh, it, it de-represses the entire operon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is that then in that case, why in case of wild type, uh, the treatment of NO leads to uh, less aconitase activity? So I, I, I think, <clears throat> you know, as long as um, NO is around, so it's going to damage iron sulfur cluster, for example, of uh, aconitase. And then it would take some time for iron sulfur cluster biogenesis to work on that damaged iron sulfur cluster and repair it. Okay, so mm -hmm. you see that um, as long as we are keeping cells in NO, we see a reduction and in a concentration dependent manner. And as we shift those culture into NO free medium, okay. after an you know, aconitase iron sulfur cluster is damaged, uh, within 12 hours, we are able to see recovery to 100% aconitase recovery. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you do that experiment for only two hours in an NO free media or four hour, we don't say so it's a time dependent recovery which is taking place. I forget uh, whether did you also see the effect of NO on the bacterial viability of the mm -hmm. uh, so far wild type and the yeah. so far. So, so uh, also remember Nishit, uh, also remember that our so far mutant is slightly different because in so far mutant, not only we disrupted so far, okay. but we also lost inducibility of sofoperon. Okay, I got it. You know, so because of polar mutation. So it is essentially a mutant which has a very basal level of iron sulfur cluster biogenesis going on. And that seems to be not sufficient for repairing anno damaged iron sulfur cluster. Mm -hmm. That's what our observation is that. And uh, there also with so far mutant, we guess exactly the same phenotype which we got with Sufti knockdown. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, uh, with uh, six doses of NO, we were able to induce vector stasis. RB comes out of that stasis as soon as we remove NO. But um, so two T or so far mutant, both takes probably two times more, you know, 14 days as compared to seven for wild type RB. So they are quite sick in coming out of NO mediated. Stasis. Did you try any other uh, reactive oxygen species like H2O? Huh. Yeah, so we tried, I think uh, it is also far also is sensitive to CHP as far as okay. I remember. Yeah, it's also sensitive to oxidative stress, but uh, it's more sensitive to nitric oxide and also iron limitation. That work we could not publish if you, I think Amit Pandey has already shown that if you limit iron, a mutant is sick. So we also get the same thing. Um, you know, iron is very sensitive to iron limitation also. Which is quite uh, expected. Expected. Right? It's expected. Yes, it's expected. And my last question is that why you see only 50% reduction in the aconitase activity yeah. upon soft <laughs> depletion? Yeah, so <laughs> that's a question I myself is asking. One reason could be because there is aconitase in the background, uh, the ICS in the background, cysteine B cell phase, which is already functional. So in, in SOF S, SOF R or SOF T knockdown, you're only knocking down SOF system. ICS, which also has been shown to interact with aconitase by Stewart Cole, uh, and we also show we have also shown that ICS, um, uh, you know, mediated aconitase uh, activity is there. We think that uh, probably aconitase. So is did you try it. checking it in the uh, knockdown knockout stream? Uh, now we are going to do that. Okay. Actually, if you look, see the the issue is that uh, with ICS mutant, I have not shown you the data under normal growing condition. If I use ICS mutant. Uh, aconitase activity, which was going down 50% in so far mutant, goes 98% down in ICS mutant. Oh, oh, okay. So ICS seems to be a dominant cysteine D sulfurase under a standard growing condition in terms of making iron sulfur cluster of aconitase at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the phenotype in mice is quite uh, distinct. Like uh, it is very distinct. I think that one is goes hypervirulent, uh, one goes at an right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that is where uh, we are putting our brain. Why is you know we need to explain. Yeah. Very good.
Wonderful. Thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you for your time. So at the end, I would like uh, Dr. Neeraj to give you a few words and vote of thanks. Thanks, Nishi. So we all know that there is no time limit for scientists to discuss science. And uh, but fortunately or unfortunately for this lecture, there is a time limit. And again, we have to follow this. So just to thank everyone, I would start with uh, thanking uh, our executive director, Dr. Pramod Gar, who not only inspired and encouraged us to start this uh, lecture series, but also has been an active participant in this uh, discussion. So he always been uh, here to add the clinical perspective to all the talks and just to see what is the transgressional possibilities is there. So thank you, Dr. Gal, for uh, for uh, encouraging us to have those uh, lecture series and active participation. Then I would like to thank uh, Dr. Amit uh, Singh, who is my senior of uh, MSc as well from IIT Roorkee. So uh, we are really amazed the work he has presented uh, uh, presented uh, in this lecture, and I'm sure uh, some of us might be contacting him for potential collaboration sooner or later. And he will be happy to help and collaborate with us. So thank you, Dr. Amit. And as a token of thanks from our side, from PHSCI, we would love to give this momento okay. to you. But again, like now we have to post it to you. Uh, uh, so we'll post, post it. Keep it there. Hope. I'll take it. Yeah. So I hope you will get it intact. Better so, uh, you visit us uh, yeah. during your you know next visit to Delhi. Sure. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And uh, then I would like to thank uh, all the attendees who has been very enthusiastic with the talk and been very active in uh, asking questions and just thinking what would be the next and getting the feedback, what what to be important for their discovery as well. So thank you, attendees. And then I would like to thank uh, Nishi and the Academy Committee for their uh, uh, their efforts to make this uh, lecture happen because. Uh, Unless we have somebody following it, it's really hard to uh, execute it at this stage. And then, in last, I would, uh, but not the least, I would like to thank uh, thank our uh, IT committee. And there may be many more whom I really don't know whether how they have contributed. And of course, they uh, would have contributed in this. So I would like to thank them as well for enabling us to have this uh, wonderful uh, talk today. So thank you all. Thank you very much. And Dr. Amit, we will be happy to host you some other time as well. And thanks for sharing the good knowledge and science with us. Sure. Thanks, Thank you. Yes. Thanks. I'm done, Nishit. Thank okay. you, Amit. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, Nishit. Okay, Amit. Bye. Nice meeting you all. Yeah. Take care, guys. Yeah. Bye.